Hello, I'm Liz Head, and I'm president of Providence League of Women Voters, and I'd like to welcome you to the first of three uh, mayoral debates that we're having in the libraries. Um, this one in Mount Pleasant next week. There'll be uh, Rochambeau and the following week in South Providence. Um, just a couple of things. Would everybody please turn off their cell phones? And uh, please do not record audio or video. Uh, the This forum debate is being streamed live and um, we, so so it'll be on the library YouTube channel if you need to see it again or if your friends ask you about it you can point them to that uh, location uh, and we also ask that you hold your applause until the candidates have made their closing remarks. And league members, Mary Frances, if you raise your hand. Okay, she, ha uh, she has index cards and pens if anybody needs to, wants to write a question, okay? And now I would like to introduce Cheryl Spade. Spacey. Thank you. I just want to say hello and welcome to the Community Libraries of Providence. I wish Donna Whiting were here. She's in charge of the Mount Pleasant Library, and I know she would be so thrilled to see all of you here tonight, as I am. Um, this is what libraries are for. They're community centers. They're places to get engaged. They're places to learn about our city. I want to thank all three of our candidates for being here in our in our space tonight, and I thank all of you for your, for your commitment to the process and for learning all we can about the candidates. And I want to acknowledge Councilwoman Joanne Ryan is here in our audience as well representing this ward. So welcome everyone on behalf of the library and I thank the League of Women Voters for partnering with us and for bringing these um, important conversations to the libraries. So thank you all. All right, we will, uh, the basic format of this will be, we'll have opening statements for two minutes from each of the candidates starting with Council, Councilman LaFortune. Uh, La and then um, Mr. Guevara and then Mr. Smiley. And uh, if you all would sort of, I, I'm sure in your opening statements you introduce yourself. Um, so I will, I will refrain from trying to introduce you. Um, let's see. Okay, so we will start off with council, councilwoman, thank Please. you, and you have two minutes. Thank you, uh, thank you to the Providence Community Libraries and um, the Providence League of Women Voters for organizing uh, this forum, and also to all of you who are here today. My name is Councilwoman Mirabella Fortune. I usually stand up, but because the mics won't reach as high as I will go, and I'm wearing heels, um, I'll sit down to do it today. But I am running to be the next mayor of Providence. I've been on city council for the past five years. I grew up right here in the city of Providence. In fact, I, did, I went to school not too far from here. I went to Pleasant View Elementary, uh, Nathaniel Green Middle School, and Mount Pleasant High School. My aunt actually lives on Carlton, so she is a resident of this neighborhood as well. I am a proud product of the public schools. My children are public school kids. We need a mayor that has both the professional experience as well as the lived experience to move our city forward. We have some real challenges that impact the city of Providence. We need a mayor who's going to ensure that every child in every neighborhood has access to a quality education, that we have safe communities, regardless of what neighborhood you live in. We also need to ensure that people can afford to live here and have access to a thriving economy and a government that works for everyone. That means ensuring that your streets are plowed, um, your trash is picked up on a regular basis, your quality of life is improved because we know these ATVs have been quite problematic for quite some time, and also just making sure that the mayor is listening to the voices of the, the community and bringing the voices to City Hall. For too long, we have settled for the status quo. And I do believe that we need a mayor who's going to get things done. I look forward to our conversation and hearing some of your questions today. And uh, I will have an opportunity to share my platform. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gonzalo Cuervo. 
and I'm running for mayor. And I actually live at 328 Mount Pleasant Avenue, a stone's throw from here, with my wife. And I'm very excited to be here today. Thank you to the Providence, Providence Community Library. Oh, the system died. Here we go. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. Mm -hmm. Died for all of us. <laughs> all right. Well, um, thank you all for joining us. Um, my name is Gonzalo Cuervo. I live here in Mount Pleasant at 328 Mount Pleasant Avenue. I'm running for mayor. And um, I'm running for mayor for a very basic reason. I've been involved in community organizing, government, and nonprofits, and all types of different activities in this city my entire life since I was 19 years old. I started out as a community organizer. I um, ran a small business on the south side of Providence. I've worked in the nonprofit sector. I've worked in the nonprofit sector. And I spent many years working in government in a number of uh, leadership positions. I worked in the city of Providence under two administrations for more than a decade, and most recently I was Deputy Secretary of State. Most importantly, what drives me to run for mayor is a very simple fact. Our city is living two different realities. There's one reality for upwardly mobile people who can afford to live here and enjoy everything that is fantastic about Providence. And there's another reality for people that are struggling to get by in the gig economy, the informal economy, and are slowly or sometimes rapidly being priced out of, priced out of their own neighborhoods. This is fun. Um, we need to close that gap. If we don't close that gap, it's going to impact all of us, whether we're doing well or we're struggling. And the reality is the only way we close that opportunity and wealth gap is by addressing the underlying issues and, and creating opportunities for our, youth, for our families and for our small businesses so that we can address the issues of our time. We can make sure that we have safe and clean streets, affordable housing, public safety that works, and a government that is sustainable and equitable for everybody. Thank you so much. I look forward to the conversation tonight. Okay. Feel free to stand. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go mic free and stand if that's okay. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, it's such an important election that's now just 19 days away. Uh, so I appreciate everyone taking the time to inform yourself. Uh, I'm Brett Smiley and one of the Democratic candidates for mayor this year in Providence. Uh, I'm excited to run for mayor because Providence is such a special city. I love Providence, and I believe it has all of the ingredients to be a true world-class city. I also think it can be one of the best-run cities in America by getting back to what matters, getting back to the basics, by focusing on quality of life issues, neighborhood issues, to improve the quality of life for all of us. That starts with basic city services for me. Everything from better snow removal to finally fixing streets and sidewalks to the quality of our infrastructure and how we care for it. We've seen the improvements on the parkway and the investments that that took place and what it means to make proper investments in our neighborhoods, but every neighborhood in Providence needs similar investments. And that's why I'm running, to focus on these neighborhood quality of life issues. But being the best run city in the country also includes having the best run schools in the country. And after two years of the state takeover that's yet to yield any real results for Providence families, I'm committed to getting the takeover back on track, to working with the next governor, to deliver on the promises that were made. I'm also committed to restoring a sense of safety to our community by, by restoring real community policing, focusing on violent crimes and gun crimes, but also on quality of life crimes, the motorcycles and the ATVs. I'm confident that we can have a safer city for everyone in Providence. After having served as Governor Raimondo's chief of staff, the state's director of administration through the worst days of the pandemic, the city's first chief operating officer. I've been there, I've seen what works, what doesn't work, and what needs to be fixed, and I'm looking forward to getting to work on behalf of all of us who know how special Providence is and that it can be a true world-class city. Thank you. Thank you all. And now we'll start with the questions, and we'll start with Mr. Coerdo. And I think you probably want to stand sure. if um, okay, the question is, currently the police are asked to respond to many calls that are not directly related to crime. What role do you think the police have in answering these calls, and are there other ways to handle this? Yes. Uh, did, did you mean me this? Yes. Yeah, okay. Let me reread it, and we'll start restart the timing. Currently... The police are asked to respond to many calls that are not directly related to crime. What role do you think the police have in answering these calls, and are there other ways to handle this? Is that better? 
Yes. Okay. All right, Mr. Cuero. So we've seen uh, a trend in public safety. There are there are a growing number of calls that the police has to make that are for people that are experiencing different types of crisis, behavioral health crisis, a uh, crisis that's brought on potentially by by substance abuse, and the city has taken steps forward, and I know that we'll hear from my colleague soon because she played a role in, in creating a, a pilot program for a diversionary program so that we can increase the, the diversity of our response to these. Not every call requires a police officer with a gun to come and resolve the situation. And I think we have a perfect example in another wing of our public safety, which is our firefighters. You know, they're all trained as EMTs and they respond to a number of these similar crises and they show up with the first aid kit. They don't have guns, they don't have badges, and they are able to manage the situation admirably. I think there's an opportunity for us to expand the diversion of these responses, understanding that, that if the more we do this, the more we free up our, our resources and our police officers to fight um, or, or to resolve or prevent other types of crime. Thank you. Great. Okay, yes. um, can you perhaps clarify how, how long to oh, answer the I'm questions? I'm sorry, yes. Um, the first person to answer the question has one minute, okay. and the other two uh, each have 30 seconds. Okay. So, oh. so I also support the crisis uh, response teams and by and better training our 911 operators so that they can deploy whatever the best response is whether that's an officer uh, or a mental health worker or an addiction counselor uh, but not as a way to reduce our policing but as a way to expand our protection and because by deploying the sort of professionals necessary to respond to those crises it frees up police officers to stay focused on violent crime on gun crimes and on things that we do need to deploy a uniformed officer to and so i think that we can enjoy and appreciate better safety better police coverage uh through these crisis response teams and then better utilizing our police officers and thank you councilwoman uh, fortune so I actually led the effort to create the first behavioral health crisis response initiative in the city of Providence and worked with the police, um, the acting um, fire chief, uh, fire department chief, and public safety and practitioners to create this framework so can, we can respond to people's behavioral health needs. So they're not being criminalized for homelessness, uh, mental health, or behavioral health. But we need a comprehensive approach to public safety. That means community policing who understands, uh, police officers who understands the community, but also investing in the neighborhoods to prevent the crime from happening. That's a comprehensive approach. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Smiley, the next, the next question. Um, do you favor an elected or appointed school board? What should the board have the authority to do? Uh, so the city just went through a charter review where they are now proposing and all of us will vote in November on a proposal to go to a hybrid school bottle, a uh, school board, half elected, half appointed. Um, I'm going to vote no on that. Uh, I think that infusing more politics into our school system is not the solution to what's wrong in our schools. Uh, but at the same note, I think we can do a better job with the current appointed school board. Uh, I've heard from many families parents who feel voiceless in their child's education, who don't feel like the school board accurately re represents them. And so as mayor, if the appointed school board persists, if the, if the change fails in November, uh, I will put criteria around our appointment so that we can take some of the politics out of the appointment process and make sure that we've got the skill set and the representation necessary to adequately govern our schools. I think the school board uh, post takeover should be involved in governance, should be involved in hiring and firing the superintendent, and should set policy for the school board, but then the superintendent and school leaders should be responsible for the actual uh, decisions in the classroom or at the school level. Thank you. Council <clears throat> Councilman. So I am in support of a hybrid model, although I did uh, vote to uphold the mayor's veto because of the process. We needed a more open and engaging process as a parent, that's important. But having a hybrid model allows us to appoint members to keep a level of continuity, but then people can participate in the elect uh, electoral process or elected process. Um, 
having an appoint, uh, appointment process also gives people who can't run a campaign. It's costly. We also add layers of bureaucracy to it, so that provides a balance. But we do need to give the school board more autonomy. That's something I've advocated for. The school board should be able to manage um, the school or make decisions about the school budget. Um, so part of that is transitioning our schools back to local control, making sure our pool, school board is well equipped to make decisions and giving them the autonomy that they deserve to have. Thank you. Mr. Coyabro? Yes, I, I will be voting no on the um, hybrid school board. I've been a vocal proponent of elected school boards for a very basic reason. My whole life, I've been a proponent of civic engagement. And I think it's important that people have the opportunity to run. Most cities in America have elected school boards. In, in Rhode Island, there are only two cities that do not have elected school boards. There's an opportunity for people to become engaged. And there's always going to be an upside and a downside to every model. And the fact is, the hybrid model that was proposed is little more than a political compromise. You know, you could have a mayor that, that could appoint five of their friends and make sure that one person gets elected and they control the majority. That, to me, would be unacceptable. Thank you. Councilwoman, um, the next question is, what ideas would you push for improving student performance and satisfaction? So, you want to pass you wanna, oh, we can pass the mic. Can you pass Don't start the mic? my time yet, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. So, improving. Okay. So, improving. Can you hear? Is it working? Yeah. All right. So improving student performance. One, we need to ensure that our schools, our students' mental behavioral health needs are met. I actually passed legislation to increase social emotional support in our schools because kids have been calling for that. There is studies that show the correlation between having that support and also academic a, a better performance in schools. Um, we also need to have a, a curriculum that truly reflects the diversity of our student body. Um, when I was a grad student um, studying urban education policy at Brown, my team actually worked on the ethnic studies curriculum and provided a report to the school department. But we need to set the conditions to make sure our school buildings are well equipped and safe um, in 21st century school buildings. We need to have a uh, uh, 21st century um, before and after school opportunities for our students, including arts, we have taken that away, and also a diverse body of teachers. I would like to implement a teacher residency program and also work with Mount Pleasant High School that has a teacher academy. But we need to invest in our students, we need to invest in our schools, but set the conditions so that our students and teachers can thrive. Thank you. <laughs> it's like a tongue twister. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, can you repeat the question, please? Oh, yes, I can. Um, what, yes, what ideas would you push for improving, uh, what ideas would you push to improve student performance and satisfaction? Yes, so a big part of uh, performance and satisfaction is consistency and accountability. What we've seen in Providence is uh, kind of a, a rotating door, a revolving door of leadership, of curriculums, of lesson plans. There's a change every couple of years. There's a new superintendent. There's a new company that comes in with a great new curriculum model. And there's very little consistency. We need to bring consistency of high-performing districts have long-term plans. They have long-term implementation of curriculums. And they have employees that want to hang around long-term as well. We need to think about that. We also need to improve our buildings, not only to restore them, but also to prepare them for 21st century education okay. opportunities. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Smiley, 30 seconds. Yeah, this is a long question for 30 seconds. Um, but so the state takeover plan, the turnaround plan needs to be implemented without starting from scratch. We don't need another plan. We have a plan. We need to finish that plan. At the same time, I would like to continue to preserve the option of high quality charter seats for families who want them. And I have a plan for universal pre-K in Providence so that every family who wants to send their child to high quality early child education will have a seat to do so. When I served in the Raimondo administration, we made funding available to cities and towns. Providence can do so in an affordable way to all of us and improve student outcomes for an entire student's career. Thank you. 
right, Mr. Cuervo, the next question. Um, I think that's right. Yes. <laughs> um, I thought I made a grid that would work, but it's not working very well. Um, do you favor moving the transit hub from Kennedy Plaza to the proposed new location, and why? You there's been a there's been a lot of debate around Kennedy Plaza, and the concern that I have with that debate around Kennedy Plaza is that half of the folks are talking about transit um, ease of use and transit um, making transit more accessible to folks and making it more viable alternative for people that traditionally wouldn't take transit. But a lot of the conversation has also been about um, kind of trying to move a certain type of people out of Kennedy Plaza. And I think that's unacceptable. And I think that any opportunity to move the transit hub um, has to make sure that it's being, decisions are being made because it's going to improve the experience of people who use RIPTA. It's going to make it easier for people to use mass transit and it's going to encourage more folks to use it and not simply because they're trying to move a quote unquote certain element out of Kennedy Plaza. And so I am supportive of the measure to the extent that <coughs> transit riders and advocacy groups that, that speak out on behalf of transit riders have the opportunity to weigh in and feel that this is the best possible option. Thank you. Mr. Smiley, yes. Uh, I do support the proposal to move uh, the bus hub from Kennedy Plaza to uh, a series of surface lots that are outside of the Garrahe Courthouse. It is proposed to be an enclosed development with amenities, amenities for riders, amenities for our drivers, and several of the proposals include uh, the inclusion of affordable housing above. I think it will be an enhancement uh, to the city. I think it will help add additional affordable housing units for our city. Uh, and it's been designed in a way that at least that's what's been promised is that it will add no additional stops for riders. And so I think it can actually enhance the rider experience. I think it can provide an, a, an important amenity for our drivers who have a tough job uh, while be contributive to downtown. Councilman? I recently talked to someone who takes the bus and for what would it for getting to the other side of town, which if you had a car would take about 10 minutes, takes them over an hour. So having a bus hub where people um, can get their tickets, it will make it more accessible. Um, it's a centralized location is something that I do support as long as it's sustainable and it's what the riders want. But we also have to make investments in our transit system overall by adding more routes um, and also making sure that the, the bus stops that are in our neighborhoods they're clean, they're equipped, and they're covered as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, Mr. Smiley. Um, what will you do to improve public access to city government meetings? Please be specific. So civic participation and public access is critical. And I think in now, post-pandemic, there is a virtual and in-person uh, goals that we need to meet. First, on in-person, we need to reopen City Hall. Uh, City Hall is not a welcoming building right now. You have to come in through the alley. It looks like it's closed. There are a lot of people who are not in the office anymore. It is time to reopen City Hall to encourage civic participation, not just for public meetings, but for public services as well. And, and the city and the council have made a lot of investments in technology over the last couple of years, which has been great. I think we need to continue that. When I served in City Hall, uh, I did the first two mayor, uh, the first two budgets in the Alors administration and finance committee meetings and the public hearing for the budget, the single most important thing that the council passes on the year, there would be one public comment, three public comments. The level of participation was embarrassingly low and we need to make it easier for people. And I think that through technology, through Zoom, through other uh, forms of engagement, we've all gotten much better at accessing public meetings. It's now more convenient. You can do it at home while having dinner, while caring for your children. And I will keep those doors open virtually and physically. Thank you. Okay. I'll just project. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. All right. So one of the things that I would do is improve the technology across the board in City Hall just to make things more accessible. We also live in a city that's quite diverse where people speak multiple languages. So we have to make sure that the information is all as, uh, also accessible. 
The other thing, today I was knocking on a door and this woman, she cannot leave her home. So we need to ensure that we're having community meetings, we're sending information and things are publicly posted on a website that you don't have to kind of just search through or need a search team just to find basic information. And one of the things that I would like to do um, within City Hall is make it easier for businesses by having a business liaison office within economic development. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, 30 seconds. Uh, one of the, the, the silver linings of the pandemic was that the civic participation increased significantly when people were able to dial into a Zoom call while they were doing something else at home or maybe they were driving in their car and they could listen in and comment. We need to build upon that. We need to build upon the hybrid model. I know the, the city council has done a fantastic job of, of maintaining that, but we need to expand that. And the other thing we should be doing is we should be looking at opportunities of moving in-person meetings outside of downtown and having them in, in neighborhoods, for example, in libraries. We have nine libraries all over the, all over the city. There's an opportunity to host meetings in different libraries and also to expand our ability to notice meetings. Okay. Thank you. All right. I'm not being terribly good about stopping you, but but I, I so far I think everything you have to say is important. So um, I hope that everybody agrees with me. Um, next is let's see. Councilman Lefler, did you start this time? No, I did. That's, did. I, that's what I thought. Okay, Councilman Lefler. Okay, so do, do you have a plan B for resolving the pension crisis if interest rates continue to be unfavorable for issuing the pension obligation bonds? So and they, you have one minute. One minute. Okay. So we have five years. So with the pension obligation bond, and many people voted um, for us to be to enable the city to take out this bond to uh, to stabilize our pension system. It wouldn't address it. It's one tool in the toolbox. In 2018, and just to give a little history, so the pension is currently about 23 percent funded, which puts us in a critical state, and to put us in a um, a more sustainable state, we have to get to about 60% funded. Um, so that pension obligation bond, if the interest or the market is in favor of the city, it would work. In 2018, I worked on the pension obligation report. One thing we should look at is transitioning to the state pension system, also looking at city assets and um, looking at selling it off like these fire stations that have been used as storage to generate revenue. We also need to hold our major nonprofits, our universities that are not paying taxes on their non-mission driven. Uh, properties to pay more taxes. I passed legislation to do a full assessment of the pilot program and um, to ensure that our city is getting our fair share and to improve our educational system so that we can um, grow our tax base as well. Thank you. Mr. Perreco? Yes, uh, it's very likely that the pension obligation bond will not be able to be used as a tool because interest rates are high and they're probably not going to go down below the threshold that was set in the near future. So we have to look at other alternatives. The reality is that when you have a $1 billion or $1.2 billion shortfall, selling a building for two or $300,000 is a little short-sighted. What we have to be looking at is how do we grow the tax base consistently over time? And the way we do this is by increasing economic development and by holding our large nonprofit institutions accountable so they're paying more of what the amount they should be paying instead of continue to be subsidized by us smaller residential and commercial taxpayers. We have to have long-term consistency with responsibility and accountability. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Smiley, I know these are difficult. It's, it's only the time that's difficult. It's not the question. The, uh, uh, I, do, I actually am optimistic that over the next five years, rates will come down to make the, the POB a viable option. But were that to not be the case, uh, I do think we should work with our labor unions and state leaders to explore transitioning into the state system we absolutely need to have an economic development plan to expand the tax base. I hope we get a question about it later because the renegotiations with our large nonprofit institutions is a critical question that impacts not just this question, but many other answers for how we uh, work in a sustainable future going forward for our budget. I would like to answer to that. The, the level of funding that the Providence Pension Fund has right now is so low that it would be impossible you for have the to state follow the to rules. <laughs> you have to follow the rules. <laughs> no, no, no. I said that if if they 
if you wanted to answer something specifically, you had 15 seconds. Oh. Mm -hmm. and, okay. Sorry. That wasn't clear. Sorry. Uh, Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so, so can I answer specifically? Uh, In order I, for us to enter the state pension system, which would be the ideal, we have to be at a level of funding that is, that is acceptable to everybody else that's in the state system. But where we are now is not there. So while that is the ideal and that's what we want to work towards, that's not something that's going to happen in the near future. Okay. Just to clarify that fact. All right. <laughs> um, no, I'm sorry. Where are we now? <laughs> okay. Um, we are now with Mr. Cuervo on the next new, a question. New, new question, okay. New question, and he has one minute to answer. The current proposal to save the Superman building includes a 30-year tax stabilization agreement. What is your opinion of tax stabilization programs, and, uh, and when should they be agreed to? Tax stabilization agreements are long-term plans where we tell a person we're only going to charge you a fraction of what your new development would pay over a period of time and it escalates. It escalates over a period of 12 or 15 years normally. In the Superman building, the city is agreeing to a 30-year plan. Um, there are ex uh, exemptions that are important. I think it's important that the Superman building get developed. Generally, tax stabilization agreements have been used as a crutch. It's the only tool in the toolbox that we've had for years. And it's gotten to the point where developers, even if they don't need one, they ask for one ahead of time because they know they're going to get it. We need to move away from that and we need to, to incentivize development through improved um, city services, better regulatory environment, and just a better, more welcoming environment for developers so that we don't have to be using TSAs as a crutch continuously. Thank you. Mr. Smiley, 30 seconds. So the tax stabilization agreements are a solution to the problem that our commercial tax rate is not competitive. And, and the TSAs that I support, the ones that are uh, appropriate and responsible, are ones where the, the proposal never pays less than the building paid on day one. So if it's a redevelopment, it's not a discount. It's just a go forward. And that they all phase up to full taxation so that the building owner always pays their fair share by the end of the agreement. They also, in my view, will always in include local hiring commitments, the utilization of minority and women business enterprises, and unionized labor. Because that, that's how I think there is community benefit to the tax stabilization that we're providing. Thank you. So the TSAs, I wouldn't call it a necessary solution to our tax, um, our high commercial tax rates, but it's a tool to attract businesses here. Um, I do think that our TSAs have been problematic for quite some time. I actually co-sponsored legislation to create a position for someone to manage the TSAs to ensure that what these developers are committing to do that they're actually doing. However, we do need to improve our quality of education, our schools. I do think if we had better schools, we would not have to use the TSAs as often as a tool to attract people to invest here. If we had good schools, businesses would want to come and invest in the city of Providence. People want to stay here. So I think one tool to address this TSA situation is also investing in our educational system to make Providence a more attractive place to do business and live here and thrive. So. Thank you. All right, we'll take one more question from this list, and then we'll, uh, uh, we have some really good audience questions, and I think very important to the community here. So um, we'll do that first. Um, okay, Mr. Smiley. Um, all right, affordable housing is becoming ever more scarce in Providence from both rising house price, home prices and rising rents. How do you plan to address this issue? <laughs> One minute. One minute or less. <laughs> uh, affordable housing is a, a top priority. It's a crisis in our city now. We need both more affordable rental opportunities and affordable home ownership opportunities. Uh, we have significant vacant, abandoned, and blighted properties in the city of Providence. I look forward to working to uh, redevelop those aggressively. The state has made significant funding available uh, and, and many suburban communities because of bias and prejudice and a lot of other reasons 
fight affordable housing developments in their community. Uh, I want to see it in Providence. We've got families who are being priced out. The only thing that's been built recently almost exclusively is studio apartments for college kids whose parents are paying the rent and not actually apartments that families can live in. We also need to not forget home ownership opportunities, though. That's how families build wealth, have something for retirement or something to pass on to their children. And so through things like down payment assistance, through mortgage guarantees to make sure that first time home buyers, first generation home buyers can actually compete in the housing market is how we start to lift up communities that have not started to accrue wealth yet and we want them to. Thank you. 30 seconds. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm going this way, I think. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So affordable housing, we need more units. Uh, we need to also develop more housing and we need pathways for home ownership. I actually introduced legislation, it's a residential TSA to incentivize the development of affordable housing. We also have to look at some of our zoning policies that have served as barriers that have prevented us from building. Um, but again, we don't have to recreate the wheel. We have West Elmwood housing, that's a model. Um, we have to invest in neighborhoods, but also have a grasp on the rise of rent. But it's economics. The housing stock is low and it continues to drive the prices up. So we need to build more housing opportunities um, throughout the city of Providence. Thank you. Mr. Guerrero. Yes, I'm the candidate who has a real plan, a bold <laughs> plan that I released last week. You can read about it in the media. Um, here's the reality. We already have all the tools that we need to be building market rate and affordable housing. We have the Providence Redevelopment Agency, the Providence Housing Authority. We have CDBG funding, Community Development <coughs> Block funding that comes from the federal government. We have all the tools at our disposition. What we have to do is reorganize the mission of these entities and these tools to begin to build affordable and market rate housing now. It's being done in other parts of the country. We can do it here. We can also um, implement um, zoning changes and also I'm calling for a, a rent stabilization because our families are being driven out of our neighborhoods by okay, exceedingly you. high rents. Thank you. Can I have the, uh, my, the 15 I, seconds? Yes, you can have 15 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> Thank you. But we also have to have plans. We have to have plans that are practical. We can't have a plan that only addresses the housing or, or stabilizes the rent for old properties. What about the new housing? Does that mean people who can't afford um, to live in these newer developments um, have, don't have access to it? So we need to take a comprehensive approach to addressing our housing prices. That means building more housing, addressing, um, having a grasp on rent, and looking as, uh, at the um, zoning policies. Thank you. Um, I think now I, I looked at the time, and I think rather than missing out on asking, uh, presenting the audience questions, I will do that now. Um, Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is right on this topic. How do you feel about proposals for 4% rent control when increasing, uh, when increasing property tax? Um, water and sewer exceed the limit put. Oh wow! Uh, do you know who is I there? That one. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah, I know. I want to know what your opinion is on the four percent proposal on rent increases when property tax, insurances, water and sewer far exceed. What that 4% increase would, would cover the owner of a property. Okay. Okay, no applause, please, <laughs> at this point. All right, uh, and the first person for that will be Councilman Lafayette. Um, I've talked to In some. For a minute. Thank you. I've had an opportunity to talk to renters as well as landlords. Um, and one of the things that some of the landlords have said is, listen, my taxes are high, my utilities continue to drive up. And so I have to be able to pay my rent and I don't increase my, um, my rent like significantly and or yearly. So I think we need to take, again, as I stated earlier, we need to take a comprehensive approach in addressing our housing prices. Yes, 
We need to have a better control on the rises of rent, but we also need to build more housing and we need to bring people to the table um, who are impacted by this and also housing experts. Part of my 100 day plan outlines bringing the experts, bringing the people to the table to come up with a better solution, but we also have to build more housing. We have the American Rescue Act plan. I led the effort to create the task force. A task force. One of the priorities is housing, working with the state to maximize those funds, but also looking at our zoning policies to enable us to build more housing opportunities throughout the city of Providence. But we, we have to have a, a, a balanced and comprehensive approach. Thank you. 30 seconds, Mr. Corey. A whole 30 seconds. A whole so that's 30 my proposal. My proposal it, it begins with a 4% cap on rental increases. I own property. I rent apartments out. I understand the dynamics. But what I also know is that the rent increases that we've seen in current years do not correspond to tax increases or utility increases. People are price gouging. And the reality is that this begins the conversation. The mayor does not rule by fiat that these decisions are going to be ultimately set. This policy is ultimately going to be set by the council and we're going to have a public conversation. But that 4% is a realistic number that reflects how people's on average, their income grows, income grows year over year. And it reflects legislation that was introduced recently by our very own representative Morales, who's back there. Thank you, Representative Morales. This is the beginning of a conversation, but something needs to be done. Current rent increases are not sustainable, period. All right. Mr. Smiley. I'm deeply concerned about uh, rising rents and have a plan to build more affordable housing, but I do not support rent control. Uh, rent control is, has been a failed policy in other cities. Uh, there are uh, unfair winners and losers from the get-go. Uh, property owners stop investing in their properties, and it does nothing to control their costs. And so it's not a proposal that I support. I think the right path forward is the continued aggressive development of permanently subsidized affordable housing through our CDCs and through private developers to, to make uh, a sustained investment without uh, this uh, failed public policy from elsewhere. So that current model has not worked. We've been trying that for 25 years now. It has not worked. But we do have and the we're, West. We're already picking winners and losers <laughs> this every is a hot single topic. day. <laughs> but we also Currently. have the West Elmwood um, housing model, which has worked, and it's inclusionary zoning, and people are paying full market rate, and there are those, uh, and, and then people are subsidized. We have buildings that have been sitting on, uh, in the city of Providence that we haven't done anything with it. But we need to implement a policy that is actually practical, and it works for the city of Providence and also sustainable. Mr. Smiley, would you like to make any more comments? No, I've been clear on this. Um, <laughs> the, uh, Gonzalo's got a very clear housing policy that I disagree with, but I respect. Uh, the councilwoman hasn't defined yet what her rent control policy is, but I've been clear that I think it's a failed public policy. I think the, the continued rapid expansion of a permanently affordable housing through the existing community nonprofit community development corporations uh, is the right <coughs> path forward. Um, can I answer since he called me out, please? <laughs> can you answer in your concluding statement? Sure. Yeah, yeah too. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Um, this one is relatively easy, I think. Okay. We need more city inspectors to enforce parking, building code violations, trash recycling violations, yes or no. <clears throat> And maybe you can add a little bit. And this should be directed to Sorry. Mr. Corbett. Me. I think so. Absolutely we do. Absolutely. Over the last decade or so, we've dealt with shrinking budgets through attrition. And what we've seen is our departments decimated. And the reality is that, that we need more people. We need more people as inspectors. We need uh, more people driving our street sweepers in, in the middle of the night. We need more people. That doesn't mean that we're going to go on a hiring craze, but the reality is that we, there's X number of bodies that you need to do the work of city government. And, you know, good policy does not replace physical labor. And a lot of these jobs require humans to serve as inspectors, to run machinery, to pick up trash, to pick up mattresses, and to do the work that keeps our city safe and clean. Thank you, Mr. Smiley. 
Uh, yes, but I, I think the question is really about enforcement. The, one of the reasons that the quality of life in our neighborhoods has degraded is because there's very little enforcement going on in the city of Providence right now. People who are parking overnight without an overnight parking permit. People who are not keeping their properties up to snuff and it becomes a blight on the neighborhood or bad for every other house on the block. We have the ordinances and tools in place. There's just lo very little enforcement and it ends up hurting or penalizing all of the rest of us who do follow the rules. And so, yes, I do think we need more enforcement of existing ordinances and policies. It's my turn. I do think that we should have more enforcement, but do it in an equitable way. Uh, there are people park on the streets overnight, but we don't always have parking solutions for them. If there's snow, um, they have to pay for parking in addition to paying for their um, yearly uh, parking pass, a, a permit to park on the streets. Um, there are people who's struggling um, to maintain their homes. We've gone through a pandemic for the past two years, so it's also important for us to have initiatives within the city of Providence to support those or connect people to resources. So I do think enforcement's needed, but we also have to do it in an equitable way so we're not penalizing people who are poor. Um, and it's not always about following the rules because you didn't follow the rules with your campaign finances. Mm. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see. I could have sworn there was a ATV question about noise We're against pollution. That. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and there's also one about speed bumps. Okay. Um, okay, here's the noise pollution. Noise pollution is wild, widely recognized by groups such as the World Health Organization as a public health problem, which uh, contributes to um, cardiovascular and, and other diseases. Okay, poor mental health, learning impairment, and dementia. But Providence noise um, ordinances sel seldom enforced. What will you do to reduce noise pollution in Providence? And I think this probably includes ATVs. And the first is Mr. Smiley. This is yet another thing that we don't enforce currently. And so we have a noise ordinance. Uh, there's obviously quite a few complaints about motorcycles and ATVs. Um, and, and we need to work with the police department to actually enforce them. Uh, we have, uh, particularly in residential neighborhoods, along some of our commercial strips, you know, all through the pandemic, our restaurants survived by taking dining outside. And, and yet we don't do anything to enforce the existing noise ordinance. The, it's, it's difficult to do so. You need to have two police officers. It takes proper training and equipment. But we have the tools on the books. We just don't enforce them. I don't think it's going to take a lot to send a new message that gross violations of the NORS ordinance are not going to be tolerated. After you write your first couple of tickets, people will start changing their behavior. There are cities and towns across Rhode Island who do enforce their noise ordinance, and those folks don't go there, or they don't tune up their suspicion uh, uh, exhaust systems to make extra noise. But right now in Providence, uh, there's no penalties. Thank you. Councilman? There are certainly noise ordinances on the books right now that needs to be enforced. We also, a, a lot of the people who are violating it is some of the businesses. I live right behind Greg's and uh, early in the morning uh, at the crack of dawn, you hear them um, doing work in their parking lot. And it's, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's problematic. Um, and so it's about enforcing it, but also uh, holding the businesses in particular accountable and people who are violating it, making sure that we send them notice, um, Again, doing it in an equitable way, finding out what the challenge is, how we can better support them. Um, but it should be enforced, and we should hold especially the businesses accountable who are violating the noise ordinance. Yes, we absolutely should be um, upholding or enforcing our noise ordinances. But there's a great irony that we started this uh, conversation talking about uh, diverting some police calls to mental health professionals so that we can free up police officers. And yet the noise ordinance calls for two police officers to track people down who are making noise and follow up with them. I think that's unrealistic. I think there's an opportunity for us to use other departments to, to enforce this ordinance. And sure, people deserve to have quiet and quality of life. I live on Mount Pleasant Avenue. You know, I get all kinds of noise from speeding cars and motorcycles and everything. And this is a quality of life issue that's important to all of us. Thanks. 
okay. Next question goes to. I think it's me. I think it's you too. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. How would you respond to this statement? Resource officers in the schools would give students the best chance for a positive experience with the police. How would I respond to that statement? Uh, respond, or you can talk. I, I think it's basically about uh, police resource, resource officers. officers. Yeah. So the way I would respond to that is that the data and studies do not show that the resource officers necessarily um, create a positive interaction with students in the police. What does improve the culture in the schools, improve academic performance, is actually investing in social emotional support in the schools. During my uh, studies, uh, um, studying urban education policy, um, one of my research was on the correlation between school resource officers and academic achievement. And so there is no data that actually shows that, but there are other ways for us to build trust amongst police officers by having them you know, in the communities, reflecting the diverse communities that they're serving, ensuring that they're trained properly um, to engage with diverse communities, um, as well as, um, you know, having making real investments in our neighborhoods where the police officers could also serve as coaches, um, you know, in some of our little leagues. But having school resource officers, I think that they should not be in the schools. We should be um, investing in social emotional support and services. And I passed legislation for that as well. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Smiley. For, oh, oh, Mr. I'm sorry, I hit the wrong way. Uh, Mr. Cuervo? I agree with Sorry. Councilwoman LaFortune that data does not show that this improves the, the situation. <laughs> and I'll go one step further. Last year I spent some time as a substitute teacher in Mount Pleasant High School and I can tell you for a fact that the school resource officer spent most of the time in his office and would come out two times a day, walk the halls like a prison guard, and go back into his office. And I find that unacceptable. I think that, that there are much more creative ways for us to build relationships and trust between our youth and the police. I think that going back to a community policing model that engages youth and engages the community is the way to go. Thank you. Mr. Smiley? I support uh, in, in education in general trying to push down decision making to the school level so that principals and teachers have more control and autonomy over their buildings. And I support the ability for a principal and his or her staff to decide if a school resource officer is appropriate for their building. Uh, I think that that decision should be made at the school level and I think it should remain an option. I do support modifications to the current um, set up. I think that principals not only should be able to decide whether an SRO is appropriate, but they should actually have a hand in selecting which SRO. I also recognize and acknowledge the, the trauma and barrier that the uniform itself can cause and thinks that our SROs should be wearing plain clothes or more relaxed clothing and not visibly armed. Uh, can I? Yes. 50 seconds. Thank you. 15? 15, 15 yeah. yes. The problem was with, with the school, um, the SROs being in certain schools and giving the principal autonomy is that then you're going to create, again, an inequitable structure. Because what's going to happen is all the schools where majority of the kids are students of color um, that might have some challenges, like behavioral challenges, you're going to see SROs there. And then schools on my side of town probably might not have SROs on other sides of town. So we have to have an equitable policy and school resource officers should not be in any of our schools. Okay, thank you. All right. Anybody else want to make additional comments? Okay. All right. That's. We haven't talked at all about uh, climate change and uh, reducing our, our carbon footprint, et cetera. And we have one solar panels on city buildings. Where do you stand? Um, uh, and this is, oh my <laughs> gosh, I, I have lost, uh, lost SROs. track. I think it's Mr. Carter. So, so you're second. Yeah. Yeah. Right. All right. Um, so we have a great opportunity. The, the city developed a, a, a climate action plan a couple of years ago. Some of the measures that are recommended in that plan have already become obsolete because they the state has passed legislation that supersedes what was proposed there. There are other opportunities. Our city buildings are a great opportunity for us to set an example. You know, we have a lot of buildings. We have the opportunity to make sure that they're green, not only through solar panels, but also through uh, renewable energy, through uh, 
new technology for, um, for insulation, and a whole series of different, we need to set the example. And the other thing we need to do is make sure that an ordinance that has been sitting on the council for a very long time to make sure that our large commercial buildings are audited for, for energy efficiency passes so that we can have more accurate data on our, on our building stock in the city. Yeah, so I support solar on city buildings. I think the most practical, real example that's coming our way that I will be aggressive about is through our school buildings. There's a significant amount of school construction funding uh, that's been approved. We're going to be renovating or um, repairing almost all the schools in the city of Providence. When we do so, we should do so in an energy efficient uh, way that takes advantage of renewable energy sources. The other thing that's not solar that I'm very excited about and have set a goal towards to totally electrify the city's school bus fleet. Uh, school buses are particularly well positioned to become electric vehicles. They sit dormant. It's easy for them to charge overnight uh, and it will provide uh, clean air in some of our densest par parts of the city uh, reduce emissions, and I think sets a fabulous example for our young people going to school on electric school buses. Thank you. I am in 100 support of having solar panels on all our school built um, on all our city buildings, including our schools. Um, I'm a co-sponsor of the uh, of the ordinance that created the first city sustainability office. I am also a co-sponsor of the bill. Um, to measure the amount of energy that the buildings are using. I have solar, pa um, solar panels and many people have solar panels and we should be working with the state to also in, um, to work on the reimbursements to get more people to have access to solar panels, um, residential um, properties as well as commercial properties um, as well. But I'm a big supporter and also um, making sure that we meet the requirements of the climate justice plan. Thank you. For the goals. Okay. Um, we are reaching um, five after eight, and I would like to give our our candidates a chance to conclude, draw some conclusions, make a concluding statement. Um, I know there are many questions here that haven't been answered, like speed bumps and um, urban trails and bike paths and this kind of thing. But we will be having um, more uh, in library uh, forums for the candidates and hopefully I will take these questions and pass them on so that and hopefully next week we will be in um, as a former tech technical person I have utmost sympathy for the technical problems that we had so um, <laughs> um, Hopefully next week will go much better. All right. Um, with that, I'd like to start with, um, I think it's Mr. Smiley's son. Um, if that's okay. I'm, I'm not, I'm paying attention to what you're saying, so I'm losing track of where I am. <laughs> so, Mr. Smiley, if you would like to give a two-minute two minute concluding statement, that would be great. Great. Thank you so much. Moderating is a tough job, and uh, and I appreciate uh, your service tonight to the to the neighborhood. Uh, thank you all for t for coming tonight, uh, and I look forward to staying after to answer any other questions that we didn't get to. Again, I'm Brett Smiley. I'm asking for your vote in the election that's coming up in just 19 days. Um, we I mentioned a little bit at the outset, but I've had the chance to serve as Governor Raimondo's chief of staff, the state's director of administration, and the city's first chief operating officer. We've got big challenges coming our way in Providence. You know, we referenced it briefly, but the negotiation with the colleges and the hospitals is one of the greatest challenges facing our city. Right now in Providence, 40% of the land is tax exempt, which means that 60% uh, of the land is paying 100% of the bills, all of us. And so the next mayor is gonna have the opportunity to renegotiate with our colleges and hospitals to finally pay their fair share. I've got a detailed strategy on how to go about that uh, and I look forward to having that negotiation so that it can finally shift the burden off of everyone in the city of Providence, uh, homeowners and renters, uh, so that these institutions pay their fair share. We also need to reconcile with the pension challenges that were referenced earlier. Uh, the city's negotiation under the Tavares administration is about to expire, which means pension costs are going to start escalating once again. And finally, the city has received 
a significant amount of federal funds in the last year, but it's one-time money. And so these three things are going to create a fiscal crisis next year unless we have a mayor who is ready to, to meet those challenges head on, who is ready to build a team to be effective from day one. I know with my experience in both city and state government, I can build that team and be that leader going forward. I'm asking for your vote. There are a lot of topics we didn't cover tonight. You can learn more at smileyformayor.com. And thank you. for everyone because they've done a fantastic job. Uh, Councilman LaForte, please. Yes, if you're next. Thank you so much for moderating. Thank you for having us and thank you all for being here and all the tech people, thank you for trying to manage this tech situation. It is an honor to be able to, to one, serve as a city council person, but more importantly, run to be the next mayor of my city, the, my hometown, um, the city of Providence. Providence needs a mayor that has both the professional as well as the lived experience to move our city forward. For too long, we have had people up here looking down. We need someone who understands what's happening at the grassroots level. We need a mayor who's going to prioritize education. Every single child, regardless of what neighborhood they live in, should have access to a quality education. I've been doing the work to set the foundation to improve our schools. We need a mayor who's going to ensure that our city is affordable across all income spectrums, whether you're low income or no income, moderate income, or if you're, if you're aging, or as I call it, wising. Um, we need to ensure that we have housing for everyone and pathways to home ownership so that people can succeed. We also need a mayor that's going to invest in ensuring that our city is safe and we are investing in our youth. I'm the only candidate that was endorsed by the Rhode Island Coalition Against Gun Violence for my advocacy work at the State House to pass stronger sense laws. And more importantly, we need a mayor who's going to make Providence work for every single resident. That means open, honest, ethical government. That means a government that's gonna bring the voices of the community to City Hall and also implementing smart policies. I have a policy for housing because I know what it means to be homeless and ensuring that we're building more affordable housing opportunities and looking at our zoning policies. But what the city needs is not settling for the status quo and having a mayor that's going to take action and get the work done. And as your mayor, I'm committed to working for the people of Providence, not working for political leaders and operatives, but working for you. That's what we deserve. Please go on votenearva.com to learn more about my platform and vote on September 13th. Thank you. Mr. Boyer, can you Great. Yes. I thank you all for the opportunity and uh, taking the time to come here and listen to us. You know, everybody here who's running for mayor is a great candidate and loves this city. But there's a fact. Our city continues to see a widening gap between the haves and the have-nots. And the reality is that that widening gap impacts all of us, even if we're doing well. And it impacts us directly because even if you and I are doing well, the city's inability to grow its economy, grow its tax base, limits its ability to provide city services and guarantees that your cost of living here is going to increase through increased taxes. And the reality across the city, regardless if you live in Mount Pleasant or in Mount Hope, people care about the same things. They want quality schools. They want safe and clean streets. They want housing affordability at every level, not just low income housing, not just affordable housing at every level. And these things are not achievable in a city that, does, that is not sustainable. So we need to close that opportunity and that wealth gap. I have a plan to do that through economic development, neighborhood based economic development, a bold, very detailed housing affordability plan, as well as plans to revamp our education system and ensure that our streets are safe and clean continuously. I'm very proud of my history I've been a community organizer and advocate for almost 30 years. I started when I was 19 on the South Side. I have spent more than a decade under two different administrations and leadership positions in City Hall. I know how city government works inside out. I know how to build coalitions. I think my campaign is a demonstration of this. We've built the broadest coalition in recent history to get me elected so that we can affect change. And finally, I understand that I'm not here to tell you what you need and what you want. I'm here to listen to you and so that we can govern together. Thank you very much. Please check out GonzaloForProvidence.com. Thank you. Okay.
right. Um, my understanding is that the library is open until 830. Uh, but I want to leave you with this. Uh, I want to thank everybody, particularly the candidate, uh, candidates and all you who came. I, I really appreciate that as a member of the League of Women Voters who support informed voting. Okay? Um, remember to vote on the 13th, as this election will basically select our, our mayor, because we have whoever wins the primary is going to be the only candidate on the uh, November ballot. The November ballot, however, will be also, also be important for the charter changes. So you need to vote both times. 